Okay, I hit the record. Hello, everyone. Uh, this is the second event, second meetup of the Deliberators Network Turkey User Group. So today, uh, Barry, Barry Overham is with us, and uh, we'll be talking about the Zombie Scrum Survival Guide. And while we're doing so, we'll be using the celebrity interview uh, structure of the Deliberating Structures, and that's all. So, hello, Barry. How are you? Hello. I'm fine and I'm really looking forward to this uh, session and let's say that I have the expectation that it won't be me talking for 60 minutes and uh, let's try to make it a bit more interactive and let me just have a uh, shared conversation with each other that would be nice and um, well I think I already did multiple sessions about zombie scrum also for uh, for agile turkey I think I did the first one about two or three years ago I did a session about uh, how you can use strategy to fight zombie scrum, etc. Three times. Uh, and in the meantime, something happened, and that is that with these other two guys that you see over there, uh, we wrote a book. And uh, the book, that's actually this one, is the Zombie Scrum Survival Guide. The ebook got launched. Um, last week or two weeks ago, and the print edition got officially launched last Tuesday, and it's currently being shipped from the US to Europe, etc. And from there, we can distribute it further. The good news is is that we are gonna uh, give one free ebook away today during this session. And uh, we have like 15 participants currently joining. So uh, the chances are quite big that you uh, can win the, the ebook. Um, what more to tell about this one? No, not too much, I guess. Let's move to this one. We are gonna, I'm gonna share a bit about the structure that we use in the book, but I'm mostly gonna um, well, talk about the things that you consider most interesting. Uh, so for this presentation, I'll share a bit about the symptoms of Zombie Scrum that you might already be aware of if you attended previous sessions, some of the causes, and then we're gonna do an impromptu networking so that you get, uh, can get your own thinking started about, so what is it that you would like to learn more about from Zombie Scrum? And from that moment on, the focus will be answering topics that, uh, that are of interest for yourself, questions that you have, things that you would like to know more. The time box is uh, about one hour-ish, and then we'll, uh, we'll close this, uh, this meetup. So over here, you see the symptoms of zombie scrum. And can I see... Uh, not everyone has their webcam on. Just curious to see how many people already know this uh, this illustration. But I'm gonna, well, I'm gonna point out to a couple of symptoms that you might spot. One of them, and that's also a crucial one, is that the team doesn't have a sprint goal. So uh, a symptom of zombie scrum is that you don't have a goal to work against to, to, that you try to achieve. There's nothing done, so there's no done software or no done products. They haven't got any tangible improvements for years. And they somehow achieved a Scrum certificate years ago, but didn't really put it into practice. One developer turned into a zombie, and they also don't have contact with, uh, with any stakeholders or with their users. So these are just some of the symptoms of zombie Scrum. And now you might wonder, so what are things that cause zombie scrum? Well, in our book, we give about 20 plus causes, but if I would have to pick, let's say the top three or top four, then it would be these ones. This is one cause of zombie scrum, and I think the illustration speaks for itself. What we still see happening in a lot of organizations is that the business, and the IT department are completely separated. And actually in the Netherlands, I used to work for a customer where it was also actually two different buildings. So in one building, all the business people were located. And then in the other, it was actually a more preppy building, uh, the IT department was, uh, was located. And each time when the business had ideas for a new product, 
for a new feature, they would basically set up a contract, put up the requirements on a piece of paper, and they, uh, they will, would just send it to the IT departments. And then it was up to the IT departments to make a uh, accurate estimation of how much work and time it would take, send it back to business, and then business would say yes or no, go do it, or make your estimation lower or more accurate. So there was not really a well healthy collaboration going on between business and IT and eventually uh, in many organizations it leads to zombie scrum. Interestingly is that often the assumption is that the business is similar as the customer but that's the, the, the real customer or the user doesn't have to be the business. So what we see happening a lot is that the IT not only has sort of like a gap with the business department but is even more clueless about who the real user of their product is. Another one is, well, these are actually multiple ones, but in a nutshell, it's that a lot of teams and even organizations don't really know why they are using Scrum. One reason is that they had an agile coach that, tell, that told them uh, to do Scrum, but couldn't really explain like, but why? What's, what's the idea behind it? Just do Scrum. Another one is that maybe the C-level management, the CEO noticed that a lot of his competitors are also using Scrum and therefore he or she cannot stay behind and also want their organization to do Scrum because it's like a hype, it's very popular. So we should do Scrum as well in our organization. There are also certain books out there that promise, well, let's say hyper productivity in their organization when you start using Scrum. Um, well, in my honest opinion, you can achieve more productivity, but it shouldn't be the goal itself. Um, and there are also scenarios out there that predict that if you are not embracing Scrum, that as an organization, you will be doomed and you will not be able to survive the next, uh, the next decade. So these are, in my opinion, not the best reason to start using Scrum. However, when we start talking with a lot of teams and organizations, this is what they give as their reason for using it. So this is the second one. The third one is that a lot of agile transformations for the past years have been initiated in organizations. As part of an agile transformation, many people have been sent to Scrum training and everyone achieved their scrum certificate so a lot of organizations have people that are certified in as a scrum master as a product owner as a developer etc but if you don't really change the organization itself change how work is done in an organization then the certificates are pretty meaningless as well so in itself doing an agile transformation is perfectly fine in itself um, having people certified in a certain scrum training is excellent as well but you should also help the organization change as a whole and really change the entire way as it is working. Otherwise, in reality, people just have the Scrum certificate on the wall, but nothing on a daily basis is going different. And I think this is one of the most painful ones. This is like a lot of organizations think that you can just by buying or just copying some best practices that you can just copy paste and use in your own organization. You can basically create a shortcut to become a truly agile organization. And many of these shortcuts are a very famous one is like uh, the Spotify model or a uh, safe, the, uh, the scaling uh, framework. And by that you have all these roles that you might see like the enterprise coach and I don't know, so many you know, release train engineer, etc. So many standardized roles and best practices that you can use. And it feels like that you're doing a lot of good stuff, but somehow that you're very busy, but somehow nothing really changes. If you would track like the lead time, um, like are we really shipping faster? Then probably it's only getting slower. So this is another cause of zombie scrum that we see happening a lot in organizations. And it also leads to a lot of disappointments. People often start with scrum having high expectations, but what we see happening a lot is that after a while, 
that they tried Scrum, nothing really changes in reality. And then Scrum gets to blame, like Scrum doesn't work in our organization. And let's try something different. So like I said, these are not the ultimate causes, the only causes, but these are some of the causes that we see a lot around us. Okay, I've already been talking too much. So let's give you the opportunity to do some talking. And while Umut is setting up the breakout rooms, I'm already going to announce that we're gonna do impromptu networking. It's gonna be a creative version of impromptu networking because if you are familiar with deliberating structure, you might think, hey, it's in pairs. What we are going to do is in pairs or groups of three. So anyhow, small groups, in total three rounds. And for the first round, you're going to have a conversation about this question. In your small group, discuss with each other what are the symptoms and causes of zombie scrum you recognize. Recognize in your current team, current organization, or maybe in the past. So based on the symptoms and the causes that I explain, what are the things that you recognize? In total, you have four minutes. After four minutes, you'll be back in the main channel, and then I'll explain the second round. Okay, I'm ready, so we can start the breakout rooms. Yeah, excellent. Okay, so let's go. Okay. Uh, you're also invited to another room, but you don't have to go, Barry. No, I'm fine with staying here and I can prepare yeah. a bit of the, uh, the other slides. I'll, st I'll be staying too. Uh, I see Arzu is in the... So what would be our second question? What does this mean? What patterns are conclusive? I know you too. Okay. Yep. Full screen. So when everybody's back, I'll try to shuffle the rooms. Let's see. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Excellent. Also learned that you need to reshuffle the the rooms a couple of times so that they are really shuffled, <laughs> and then everyone should be in new uh, new groups. So see what people are appearing. <coughs> and welcome back. I think everyone is back in the main channel again. So this was round one of impromptu networking in which you had a conversation about this one. So what are the symptoms and causes of zombie scrum you recognize? While Umut is preparing the breakout rooms for the second round with new people, you will have a conversation about this question. So based on the symptoms and causes, if you take that into account, what does it mean to you personally? What patterns or conclusions are emerging? Are emerging? So if you take the symptoms and causes of zombie scrum into account, mm -hmm. how would you interpret it? What patterns or conclusions can you make based on that? What does it tell you about scrum or working as a team or an organization? See if you can make sense of that. Are you ready, Umut? Yeah, we are ready. We are so going. Four minutes, new groups. Enjoy. One. Okay, three, two, and one.
Hello, I welcome back time. again. Hello. So in a moment for the final round, you'll be back into the breakouts with new groups again. And this time you'll have a conversation about this question. So given the symptoms and causes of zombie scrum that I shared, and given what you sort of like with your own interpretations and conclusions were in the previous rounds, what questions, thoughts, or concerns do you have about preventing or fixing zombie scrum? Mm -hmm. So what are questions, thoughts, or concerns you have about preventing or fixing zombie scrum? Now, what you can do is share your question with uh, the one or two other persons in your breakout room. It's fine to already have a conversation about it, but that's the intention for the rest of this session as well. Uh, what you can do is share your question in a tool that Umut is going to briefly explain right now. Is that correct, Umut? Yeah, I've just sent a link in the chat. Can you see that? It's a Slido link, and yes. uh, yeah. by clicking the link or getting into the Slido and saying that 56706, you should be able to direct your questions. And further that, uh, you can even uh, vote the already present questions if you like the questions too. So after this point of the uh, events, we will be going with the questions. So the most important question will be just directing our uh, events, roughly. So if you can reach to the link uh, in the end of this four minutes, part of the impromptu networking, you should be able to uh, give your questions, okay? Oh. Yeah. Okay. So, see you back in uh, four minutes. Mm -hmm. I'm opening the breakout room. See ya. Are you able to answer some questions? Yep, I uh, see three questions right now. No people coming back. back. Ah, another question. How can we make sure that people trust each other? <laughs> <laughs> so everybody is here. So Barry, yeah. after this point, uh, let me ask you the questions as part of the celebrity interview. We have gathered all the questions with uh, using impromptu networking this time. It was a different technique for me to get all the questions. After all, I was always using one, two, four, all for this part, but mm. this is like the part I like. And if you look at the questions, you can also see them. Uh, yep. but what do you think uh, about the lack of stakeholders at this point to use? This is part of the zombie scrum that you were mentioning in one of the first slides. Yeah, yeah. And let me uh, express my uh, hope for the remaining 20 minutes. And that's that I don't really believe in like experts that for example, I'm the experts. I have a certain experience, but I'm sure and confident that all of you have their own experience. So let's just have a uh, joint conversation and see if we can just learn from each other in this one. Um, I'm fine with uh, kickstarting it and maybe uh, sh of course sharing my opinion, but uh, I'm not going to pretend that I have all the answers. But lack of stakeholders at sprint review, I'm just curious what you think about this illustration. Because this is something that we see happening quite often, and it might also be the cause that there aren't many stakeholders showing up at the sprint review. It's actually, it's this one but might even be strongly connected to uh, to this one. Without explaining this this illustration, what, what's, what do you make of it? And how could this be connected to not having many stakeholders at the sprint review? So just unmute yourself if you would like to uh, share your thoughts. So nobody's joining in, but uh, if you ask me, uh, when I'm working with some teams, we are 
having hard times to find who are we working with mm. customer and when you uh, measure the distance it's infinite because you don't know your customer at some points yeah yeah i think for me the question would be like who's the real stakeholder because the scrum guides mentioned the term stakeholder quite often but who is the stakeholder who really has a stake in the product and i think quite often people don't really have like the right stakeholder it could be like someone that is interested in the progress of your project or someone that is interested in how your team is doing that's not the same as being a stakeholder a stakeholder for me is someone that gets direct value from the work that you are doing with your team and often these are the people these are not the obvious people to invite for your sprint review so the encouragement for me would also be and that would be this illustration like who's the person that really benefits from the work that you are doing as a as a team and often it's not like the middle part like the internal departments the, the middle managers or the, the team manager or it could be like that you are building a product for an internal user then it still might be quite easy to find uh, the, the the real stakeholder could also be that you are building a product for an external client and then you might need to work a bit harder to get it and to give an example in my own experience i did some work for a dutch newspaper and at first um, the people attending our sprint reviews were like all the managers around in the company but for us the most obvious stakeholder was the people reading the newspaper but for them it was like it blew their minds and it was a bit weird in that sense that we told them why don't we invite some of the people that are uh, subscribed to the newspaper and ask them what they think about the things that we are doing so uh, that's what we started doing we just uh, started calling some of the people that subscribe to the newspaper and and, and they started attending um, our sprint reviews and it gave us much better insights and feedback on what to do next so let me go back to the question yeah uh, we have another question which is ah, excellent. on the other side uh, let me uh, continue with this one the uh, one from the bottom there's two options very uh, one team with no stakeholders and one team with lots of stakeholders so you are going to build for your stakeholders about in which order yeah so let's see is that the question when a team serves a lot of stakeholders is that the question yeah. you mean so yeah. when a team serves a lot of stakeholders and a product backlog has many items belong to different kinds of work ah can the person asking this question can they can he or she elaborate on that you just give a bit more context uh, it's me and i'm asking that uh, it, it is really obvious that uh, in this situation it is really hard to craft a spring goal mm. to serve as a uh, north star for the uh, team yeah for the sprint so when this is the situation uh, what do you do well would it for this team would it help because that's what i like about the new scrum guide is that they introduce the product goal mm -hmm. would they be able you think to define a product goal or would it mean that they discover that they are not really working on one product maybe they need to define the product again and yeah. also the stakeholders again and also the product goal yeah etc you see okay yeah because i can imagine what what i see is that if a team has a lot of stakeholders then you could wonder like are these really stakeholders but if they have a lot of different types of work on the product backlog often that work is not really related to each other it's just a bunch of work that a team has to do and then a consequence is that you have lots of different types of stakeholders but they are only interested into tiny parts of the product backlog the parts of the product backlog that is relevant for their work 
But I think what becomes transparent if you start crafting a product goal or a sprint goal is that you don't really have a product backlog. It's just a dump of work to be done. But it's, there's not really a logical order in the product backlog. And, and so I would, and then probably what you see is that Scrum is not really working out for those types of teams. It's just causing them stress. So my recommendation would be to make this transparent. Like we don't really have a product backlog. Um, as a consequence, we can't set a sprint goal. And as a consequence of that, we can't um, define a product goal. So I think for these teams, it's highly difficult to be successful. And my recommendation would be to uh, push the brake and to go back to the drawing board and to uh, rethink what type of team you want to be. You. If you do nothing, I'm sure you end up with zombie scrum. And no. it can be interesting, <laughs> but I'm not sure. I don't think you want to move in that direction. Thank you, Barry. I like the idea of hitting the brake. Yeah. It's what we need to do sometimes. Yep. Okay, we can pass to the next question, Barry. Uh, we get a vote on the right side. So we have a question with four votes. And it says that, how can we make sure that people trust each other? Oh, wow. It's a hard one. Oh, it is. Just asking, you can trust me. You're just telling people does it always help, right? <laughs> <laughs> so who asked this question? I would like to uh, have it explained by, by someone. Maybe there's a bit of background in there. Yes, sure, I can give you some background about this. So we actually came to the point during our breakout session that why sometimes our ceremonies, are, for instance, are dysfunctional, right? We say, okay, we're holding our retrospectives, but then you get to a point that people get stuck because it's actually working very good, very well within the team that people open up, uh, share their concerns, but at the end, some of the items, action items that we define cannot be implemented because we have some dependencies, right? Outside of the team, we need some support from the leadership, the management, and then it doesn't work out. And at, as a consequence, then people start to think, okay, it doesn't work anyways, right? So it's like Scrum is not helping us. The ceremonies are uh not of so much high value and so there's actually a trust issue mm -hmm. and this uh, question i think yeah it's a very really, really generic one but at, in the end i believe that it comes to the lack of trust mm -hmm. yeah. well i don't think you can ensure or make sure or enforce that people trust each other no so well, at least, and this is just my, my experience. I think that's, that's quite difficult. But what I also always try to do is just, um, as a Scrum practitioner or Scrum master, my mantra, so to say, is, is extremely simple. Um, it's just create transparency, involve people to inspect together, and as a group, make adaptations if necessary. So in this case, I would just ask myself, okay, if I have the feeling that the trust is low within our team, how can I make this transparent so that the team members themselves draw that conclusion? Because I can bring this to the team and just share it with you and say, okay, I have the feeling that there's low trust within our team, but then it's like me telling them and the consequence could be that they have the feeling that I don't trust them and then it gets only worse. So what you could do is, and I think there are tons of liberating structures of experiments that you can use is help them create transparency about the state of the team so that they draw the conclusion like we could benefit from a bit more trust, but that they are also the ones to determine how this could, could be done. And this might sound a bit vague, but to make it more tangible, like a liberated structure of uh, TRIS uh, could work out. I'm not sure how familiar you are with liberated structures, but you could try TRIS. Twice. You could try um, 
discovery mm -hmm. and action dialogue, which really focuses on so what are the root causes of uh, um, of what's going on in our team. Uh, any other ideas, Umut? Team building activities, like we were mentioning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, to to to improve trust in in in a team. Ah, oh, there's a good option from Akvin. What I need from you? Yeah. Well, oh, yeah, that's an excellent one. Yeah, I love that one too, Akvin. It helps a lot. Any other thoughts about about this yes. one? Because it's a big topic, of course. Okay, one quick question. So the last one you mentioned is called "What I Need from You." Yeah. Okay, yeah. just it's, to talk uh, about expectations from each other. Right? Yeah, precisely. Yeah, yeah. it's yeah. like uh, I think that's mm -hmm. a very good one. Yeah, cool. And and also that is like also about creating transparency. Maybe people just have different expectations from each other. Yep. <laughs> Probably so. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Thank you. May I say something about this also? Yeah, sure. Yeah, uh, for the what I need from you exercise, you can do it with an open discussion or uh, there's instructions in the baiting structures, it's wonderful. Sometimes I use this uh, structure with a main topic. For example, if team agrees that they're and then they can answer those questions for trust. Okay. For example, if you put respect, they can answer all these questions. What I need from you to feel more respect, for example, yeah. this and that. Okay. So it is good to use it yeah. that way. Too. Yeah, that's a very good one. And I think now that I gave it some more thought, I think the invitation of heard, seen, respected, Hurts and respected is a liberating structure. I think that invitation is precisely about trust. Share a story about a time when you didn't felt hurt, seen, or respected. Um, and for us, that exercise, hurt, seen, respected, is in itself a trust building exercise. But I think, even more generic, most of the liberating structures are intended to build trust. Because even like a very straightforward conversation cafe, it gives everyone the opportunity to share their opinion. Everyone has the chance to share their voice, to share their opinion and their thoughts. And that by itself already could, could, could raise trust. But it's a, it's a very good question. <laughs> uh, we are going low on our time box, Betty. So oh, no. let's answer yeah. another question and uh, move to the closing. I would suggest, what would you think? Yeah, yeah, yeah, that's fine. I'm not really stuck to the time box, but maybe let's pick, let's see if we can pick one or two more questions. Okay, uh, so with two votes, if you just vote directly right now, you can just define which one to be asked now. I think one, I, one, how can we help people to embrace the strong values? My answer would be to not enforce it and to not push it because values can also be highly annoying. Then you end up in this theoretical discussion about we need to be courageous. Um, so I always prevent talking about the strong values and just point it out uh, when they are like, let's say violated. And then again, stay away from the theoretical discussion but create transparency about the consequence. So what could be a consequence if you are not open, if you are not respectful or courageous or you don't have focus, etc. And then eventually connected to the strong values. But I always try to stay away from like the theoretical value discussion because it can become very philosophical and it's, you can have a very interesting sounding conversation, but you don't really achieve something with it in practice. Yeah, I like the idea coming from the backwards. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, and the multitasking, yeah, uh, that's a painful one. Again, it's going to be my mantra for today. Um, make the pain and the cost of multitasking transparent to management. Because I do believe that if you multitask too fast, it will hurt your organization and your team. Not only from a, if it's an extreme situation like a health perspective, people that get stressed out, but also it's just a fact that you get less work done. So just see if you can track the lead time, just 
pick some Kanban metrics and try to measure the cycle time and the lead time and do some experiments. Try, uh, do a couple of prints where you focus on uh, not that many multitasking and then track the lead and the cycle time. And maybe do the same when you are multitasking and I'm confident that you'll see a difference. And if you connect it to money, like so what are we saving as a company if we don't multitask that much? Uh, then probably they are interested in learning more about it. The coin game or the penny game, that's just a very simple game or exercise that you can do to uh, already uh, create transparency about uh, the, the cause of multitasking. I like uh, playing the penny game when doing yeah. that. Yep. Uh, organizations love it when you just show the consequences of it. I like the one, how can we convince people to keep trying Scrum when their organization is not actually supporting them in the name of empiricism? Well, I am gonna, then I haven't created that presentation, but nothing is just show them this illustration. To me, this illustration is the essence of why people should use an empirical way of working. And the term Scrum isn't mentioned anywhere. So you won't annoy management with Scrum with this illustration, but Scrum is behind it. So in a nutshell, and that's gonna be like my final sentence for this one, in complex work, more is unknown than known. The unknown is discovered by releasing done increments early and often. With these increments, you validate assumptions and you learn what is needed to avoid and the risk of spending time and money on the wrong things. As a result, you deliver more value to stakeholders sooner. As an organization, you don't have to choose Scrum, but I don't know any organization that doesn't want to support the message of this comic. So a way could also be like, show this to your organization, to your management, and then start an, a conversation about, so what are methods or frameworks that we could use to start putting this into practice. And I am a Scrum trainer, but for me, Scrum is not the only way to go. If you have other methods or frameworks that support this message, then use that. It's all about the context that's most, most relevant for you. So thank you, Mary. That was my question. Ah, what? Yeah, thank oh, you. Hooray, <laughs> I answered the question. <laughs> yeah, and maybe your recommendation is to close it in general. Um, well, that's a bit obvious, get the book. Um, do this one. Maybe my recommendation for today would be, this is a free anonymous survey. This is our focus for the upcoming months as well. You get details report on the state of your team and also recommendations in what to read, what to try, what experiment, based on your team, these are experiments that you could try, these are books you could read, these are articles you could check. Um, so a very good step if you have a Scrum team or organization using Scrum, just do this survey. There's zero commercial things connected uh, to the survey. So it's not that we benefit financially. If you do this one, it's more to, uh, to offer value uh, to the Scrum community. Once you've done the survey, just start doing experiments and the experiments are mentioned in the survey as well. And mostly just share your findings within your own community and already the community that you are part of the Turkish community. Together with the Turkish community and all the other local user groups, we are gonna organize more meetups to help you uh, figure out how to deal with uh, Scrum or Zombie Scrum in your organization. And my time box has expired. Thanks for coming up to this part. Uh, after this, we should be making the uh, ebook uh, selection, right? Oh, yes, yeah. And also, we have another one. Uh, just let me send the link for the feedbacks. In the meantime, if you can fill the feedbacks, it will be great for us to see how to improve and how to inspect and adapt. And let me share my screen, Barry, if it's okay with you. Yeah, I'll stop sharing. Okay. So uh, for the select, uh, for the, 
ebook. I've created the, let me just say, I've created the breakout rooms and I was saying that there's four rooms and let us roll two dices and see who is going to win. The first dice will be going for the which room, the second dice will be the person that is going to win. Okay, let's see. So room three and person two and Asta is the winner. Hey, congrats. <laughs> hey, thanks a lot. Happy hey. to really. If you can send us your email, Asta, we'll be delighted to share it with you. Yes, sure. Where should I send it? Should I send you a direct message? Uh, yeah, you chat? can just send it to me right now. Okay. Perfect. Or send to everybody <laughs> to know your... <laughs> <laughs> this is yeah. me, I'm the winner kind of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> no showing up here. No, I'll just and, send it to you. In yep. the meantime, I've sent you this link. Uh, it's basically two questions. Would you like to uh, recommend the Liberations Network Turkey meetup to your friend? It's like NPS for all of us. And another question will be that if you'd like to share anything with us to say, I, could, I couldn't skip it, but next questions anyways. If you'd like to share anything with us, good or bad, to improve, we would be delighted to hear that. And let me show you the live results. By the way, I realized that we were able to answer six questions, Barry. It's good though. Yeah. So I answered six questions. Yeah. Oh, that's nice. We can do another meetup and see what the record is going to be and like set the record. And, and <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's, you it's should outcome. Come. Maybe you should count the uh, number of questions you answered at other meetups. Yeah, that's a very good one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we get 11 participants getting into the survey. Thanks a lot for everything. Uh, we will close by two minutes. Cool. And then we start after an hour with the time box. Thanks a lot, Barry, for joining us. Yeah, this time. thanks a lot for, uh, for having me. And uh, as always, lots of fun to uh, collaborate with you. And I'm sure we'll uh, meet again soon. Yeah. yeah. See you uh, next next week. Yes. <laughs> ah, see you next week. <laughs> so, roughly, cool. we are trying to uh, make events like every week or every two weeks. Oh wow! We'll see if we can figure out something else next week, we will just come up with something, or the next week after that. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. We, uh, yeah. Maybe we can uh, take a screenshot if uh, everybody can open their cameras and show their funny figures <laughs> like this. <laughs> yep, I like it. Okay. Are you gonna do a countdown or <laughs> <laughs> so let's count. Okay. At three I'll be hitting the button. So one, two, three. <laughs> okay. Thanks a lot for joining us. See yep. you next time. See you next time. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Teşekkürler Umut. Kolay gelsin. Teşekkürler. Güzel. Kendinize iyi bakın. Görüşürüz. Görüşürüz. Görüşürüz. İyi akşamlar. Bro. Hello. Az kişi katıldı ya. Okay. Giderek arttır. Fair enough. Yapacak. Don't worry. Öyle bir şey var. Enteresan. 60'ın şeyi. 66'da 20 falan. Şey ya, biraz da saatle ilgili.